Before I begin, uh, it certainly bears worth repeating uh, on behalf of Mr. Gargiulo, Mr. Lewis and myself, we want to thank you for being here during the duration of this trial. <clears throat> Before I begin in addressing what I believe the evidence is going to show in this case, it's certainly w worth repeating, as Judge Fiddler stated, that what the prosecution has stated in opening statement, what I'm about to say in opening statement, indeed, is not evidence. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I begin speaking with you about the evidence, I'd like to share with you two important, two or three important principles that I hope that you will maintain during the duration of this trial. You see, Mr. Rubin and myself, we do not have to prove Michael Cartulis' innocence. You know why? Because the law says he's innocent. The law says he has the presumption of innocence, and the presumption of innocence is maintained up until the prosecution proves its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The other important principle that I just slightly touched on, that is the, the, the state, the state of California, Mr. Dameron, Mr. Aikman, their burden of proof on this case is the highest burden of proof known in American jurisprudence. It's, the, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, at the end of this trial, Judge Fiddler is going to instruct you on the law. And you're going to go into the jury deliberation room and apply the law that he instructs you on to the facts that he finds. And what I'm saying is, jurors, you could find Mr. Gargiulo not guilty of all charges. You could find him guilty of all charges. You could find him guilty of one charge, not guilty of the other charge. I mean, that's how, how, how it is. So I think as you receive evidence in this case, you, you realize that and judge it during the presentation of evidence. I want to talk about the facts. Um, but what I'd like to do with you is I'd like to bring you with me beginning back in February the 21st, 2001, February 21st, 22nd, regarding uh, Ashley Ellerman. When the case is put on by the prosecution, I can assure you at the conclusion of that presentation of evidence, you will not find one single bit of physical evidence attributed, attributed to Miss Ellerman's death. Um, Officer Lewis, Detective Lewis of the Los Angeles Police Department responded to that crime scene. They secured the crime scene. They're on Pinehurst Avenue or Pinehurst Road in, in Hollywood. And when they secured the, the location, the residence of Ashley Ellerman, they concluded that whoever attacked and brutally killed Miss Ellerman, there was no evidence of points, breaking points of entry into her residence. There were no busted door, no busted door locks, no busted windows. And as a consequence, the law enforcement concluded one or two things on how the person who killed Ms. Ellerman, how that person got in there and arrested. One conclusion was that she knew the person and left the person either. The other conclusion is that whoever made entry into the location got a key and locked the door. Because at the time, uh, I believe it was her. Her, uh, at the time of her roommate, Jennifer DeSisto, 
Uh, she unlocked the door the following morning, February the 22nd, and she found, uh, sadly found, Miss Albert the deceased. You're going to learn in this trial that there were four people who had keys to the residence of Ashley Ellerman. Obviously, Ashley had a key to her house. Her roommate at the time, Jennifer Cusisco, had a key to the residence. There was a friend of hers and a former room, roommate, uh, a gentleman by the name of Justin Peterson. He was a friend, and he had roomed with Ashley at the Hollywood uh, residence and later on moved out, but she, he still had a key. And then lastly, and I think significantly, the apartment, or I should say the building manager, a man by the name of Mark Durbin. Mark Durbin. I think he's going to be an important witness for you to focus on as it relates to the homicide of Miss Durbin. The evening of February 21st, Ashley Ellerman had a date who was going to be met by the actor, Aston Kutcher. He was going to pick her up and take her to a, a party for after the Grammy Awards that night. And so she was expecting to see Mr. Kutcher that evening. And it wasn't clear when he was going to pick her up, but I think it was going to be around the 10 o'clock time, 10.30, uh, to go to the after awards party. Um, evidence is going to show that prior to that, prior to the party, prior to the expectation of being picked up by Mr. Kutcher, uh, Mr. Durbin had gone to Ashley's house. Mr. Durbin claims, claims that he had consensual sex, consensual intercourse with her. That's his word. Uh, and Mr. Durbin, I think Mr. Uh, Aikman had a timeline dealing with those issues. Uh, Mr. Durbin claims that he was at Ashley Kellerman's house that evening of the 21st, was there for some time, and left him around 8 15, 8 30 that evening. It's, it's assumed by the prosecution that Miss Ellerman was murdered sometime after, but we don't know that. And you're going to learn that in this case, I can assure you. What you're going to end up learning from the testimony is that Mr. Durbin was at the house claiming consensual success, and left the house, went back to his apartment to shower, to clean up, the, the attack on Ashley Ellerman was brutal. I think Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis is going to say it's one of the worst attacks he's seen in his career as a homicide detective. Ashton Kircher is going to testify, and I'm going to, I believe he's going to be telling you that he was trying to call uh, Ms. Ellerman, saying, hey, I'm going to come pick you up. I'll be there in a short while. And even during the time frame when Mr. Durbin was supposed to be there, during that time frame, Ashton Kircher was not able to get a hold of uh, Ms. Ellerman. Is there any physical evidence? As I said, no, there isn't. Um, you know, LAPD did a fine job of investigation in this case. And part of their work is they bring forensic specialists. Uh, they will examine the premises, the interior, the exterior. And there's no physical evidence. What do I mean by that? No latent fingerprints, no fingerprints identifiable to 
Mr. Gargiulo, were obtained. No DNA identifiable to Mr. Gargiulo were obtained. And also, I think what is interesting too is the fact that through expert human learning in this trial, that you have what is called touch DNA. I touch you. And in some instances, I can leave my DNA on your body through perspiration, uh, body fluids, things of that nature. Uh, from the body of Ashley Element, there was no DNA obtained identifiable belonging to. Michael and by the way, there was no eyewitness to the brutal murder of Ashley Ellerin. The next in order, and that is the homicide of Maria Bruno, which occurred on December the 1st, 2005, on Arden Avenue, apartment 20. A little history regarding the dynamics of Maria Bruno and her husband, Irving Bruno. Maria Bruno left her husband, Irving, I believe it was in late October, possibly uh, sometime in November. I can't remember right now. But she left a short time. She left her husband a short time prior to the beginning of and the reason, the reason she left her husband for a because she was physically abused for nine years during her relationship. In fact, uh, it was December the 3rd, two days after Maria Bruno was murdered. Her husband, Irving Bruno, was being interrogated extensively by sheriff detectives. And during that couple hours of interrogation, Irving Bruno admitted that he had pushed his wife, threw her to the ground, punched her in the face, blackened her eyes, and using his words, his wife Maria said that was a straw that broke the camel's back. She left her husband. I want to fast forward a few weeks ahead now. Again, to December 1st, actually December 3rd, when he's being interviewed. It was during that time of the interview that he indicated not only when I blackened her eyes and I had you were a black guy. I had blacked out. I don't remember all the facts and all the things that led up to my beating out. The same line of questioning. Well, what about December first? I could have blacked out. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember the things. I blacked out. No. During that portion of the trial, dealing with the homicide, Mr. Rubin and myself will be questioning extensively the officers that interviewed him, as well as the Bruno himself. The, um, during the, 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 and I say this sincerely, the excellent PowerPoint presentation put on by the prosecution. You'll notice when we're dealing with the Bruno case, uh, there were some photographs of, of the uh, kitchen. And there on the kitchen floor 
uh, was a kitchen knife pack. And I believe the knife pack held three knives. One of which, the, 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 the knife uh, is missing or never found. And I'm assuming it's the prosecution's theory that whoever hacked and really murdered the really, 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 uh, used the knife from the kitchen pack. Regarding that knife pack, the, the fine work of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and their crime lab, what they did, they examined the knife pack to the convicts, hoping to find a way to prove belonging to a suspect. Makes sense, doesn't it? When you see the exhibits that will be presented from the interior of that house, you learn that you, the, the sheriff's crime lab, they did a lot of work trying to get evidence, trying to get evidence for the law and the person that did this attack. Again, this will be identifiable to Mr. Gargiulo found within the location. There is no DNA taken from the body of Maria Bruno that is identifiable to Michael Gargiulo. Talk about the window. You saw those photos. You remember the window was open and jar, and then they had to screen out on the outside in the planning room. Remember that? So, the theory here, the thing, understandably, is that the person made him break to the kitchen window. On that window, the apartment. Again, no DNA from the screen, no DNA from the window, no fingerprints from the window. When you take the screen off, you slide the window over. Nothing identifiable to the window. Of the The prosecution touched upon, and though it's found more in this trial, I can assure you, about a booty that was found I, I call it the courtyard of the apartment complex, uh, where they indicated that there was some DNA belonging to my home on that booty. I can assure you that the appropriate time during the trial, Mr. Rubin and myself will be addressing that with you. See, in an open statement, I can only talk about what the evidence is. I can't argue, but I'll say that. Or Mr. Rubin will say that for the uh, closing argument. Mm -hmm. call argument. Makes sense? Um, oh, I almost forgot. Um, Michael Gargiulo did live in that apartment complex. He lived on the second floor. Uh, and on, I believe it's on the ground floor. There was another tenant of the of the uh, apartment whose name is Robert. Is it Rasmussen? Thank you, Robert Rasmussen. Um, he had lived there for about five years. Knew Michael as a tenant. And following the the. The murder of Maria Bloom, naturally, law enforcement. Who did they interview? Tenants of the apartment, <coughs> trying to seek evidence, talking to, talking to uh, potential witnesses. And they spoke to Robert Rasmus. And during the conversation, he provided information that there was a guy he, he noticed, kind of a creep. He didn't use that term, but the impression I got in reading the reports uh, that he you know, didn't belong there. That kind of bothered him. So, after Maria Luna's murder, the 
detectives went back to see Mr. Rasmussen, and they showed him a series of photographs, of which Michael Gardino's photograph was presented. I believe it was a, a series of five photographs of people with suspects that resembled uh, the description that Mr. Rasmussen had given. As I say, Michael's photograph was there, presented to the, this uh, witness, claiming about the uh, person that was found around that was bothersome. And I can assure you that you're wondering in this trial that Mr. Rasmussen did not, and I repeat, did not identify Michael Gargiulo. Additionally, he selected Mr. Rasmussen, selected two photographs. I believe it was photo one and photo three of two men that more resemble the person that he was referring to. In this trial, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you a quick note version of what I think the issue is going to be. The issue in the broad sense is identity. <coughs> and that's the issue in any criminal trial. Did this person commit the crime? But the issue for you in this trial is going to be threefold. As it relates to the murder of Ashley Ellen, has the prostitution proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael Gargiulo killed Ashley Ellery. The second issue, has the prosecution proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael Gargiulo murdered Maria Bruno? And thirdly, has the prosecution proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael Gargiulo assaulted Michelle Murphy. That's the clip notes, really, the simple issue in this case. <laughs> now, you heard during the opening statement of the prosecution about evidence going to be presented by the prosecution concerning Tricia Picaccio. She's the young lady very sad case, who was murdered August 14th, 1993, almost 26 years ago, uh, there in, in Glenview, Illinois. That evidence regarding Patricia Picaccio, that evidence is coming in for a limited purpose. And I believe his honor, before that evidence is going to be presented, will instruct you on why that's being presented. But to, to tell you why, I will say this. Number one, the prosecution has to prove that Michael murdered Patricia Picaccio under a different type of standard, which he will instruct you on. But number two, it's being offered only, only for proving intent and identity and the murders and attempted murders of the people that were charged with Ashley Ellerman, Maria Bruno, and Michelle Murphy. I'll repeat that. It's being offered. The case of Patricia, I'm sorry, Patricia Picaccio, is being offered for the purpose of proving intent and identity on this case. You see, uh, Michael Gorgiu was not charged in this case, with murdering uh, Trisha Picaccio. Michael Gargiu has not been convicted of murdering Trisha Picaccio. Prosecution is going to put on evidence um, 
Regarding what we refer in the legal world, it's called a, a Perkins operation. I'll tell you what that's all about, briefly. Michael was arrested on June the 6th, 2008. And about 11 days later, the 17th, Michael was transported from Los Angeles County Jail. He was arrested for the attempted murder of Michelle Murphy, the Santa Monica case. The incident that occurred um, in 2008. And so, under the, the, the guidance of uh, Detective Mark Lillienfeld, he arranged to have Michael transported from Los Angeles County to the Almani City Jail. And you know, what we call Perkins operation, what that is, you place a, a inmate into a jail cell, you set up for recording, and oftentimes we'll use another inmate uh, who's trying to work off the case to get the favors of the system law enforcement. But in this case, uh, Detective Langenfeld used two homicide detectives, uh, each one having in excess of 25 years of experience on the force. Um, Michael called his attorney, Anthony Salerno, who was representing him on the Santa Monica case of Michelle Murphy. And so, inside the cell, you can see a photograph of it. Inside the uh, cell, you, sh you see uh, there's a phone there, and, and you, you, can't, you don't have a receiver. You can only talk into it, and it's like a, a, um, a speaker where everybody in the cell can hear. And uh, Mr. Solano tells Michael, I'll be down, don't say anything, don't talk. But it was during the, this subterfuge, uh, the objective, the objective of these two detectives who were under the disguise of being an inmate, their objective was to get him to confess to killing these women. And certainly, if the person is a suspect, that makes sense from the law enforcement standpoint. It was a 42-hour interrogation trying to get him to, to admit killing these women. And ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, Mr. Gargiulo never admitted to killing any of these women. I can assure you today, Mr. Gargiulo today denies killing Ashley Elman and Maria Bruno, as well as Trisha Picaccio, which reminds me, I forgot to say, getting back to Trisha Picaccio. Uh, Glenview, Illinois, is a suburb of Chicago. I don't know, it's about 30 miles, 40 miles away. It's really nice to meet We've been back. And, uh, uh, Michael grew up in Glenview, as well as the Picaccio family and the siblings of Patricia. That Picaccio was Michael's best friend. They grew up together as kids, grade school, high school, I mean, they were the best of friends. And Michael looked up to Patricia as an older sister. Michael was always over at the Picaccio family. Um, the family knew a lot of I can assure you, um, we'll get into this because this is going to take some time. Uh, we're talking about uh, some DNA on a family of Patricia Takachi. We'll deal with that. And I can tell you it's not going to be the hell. It's not going to be the lot in this case from the defense team. 
you know, it, it's been a long day for all of us. Um, there were moments like this where I, I wish I could say more to you, but I'll save it. Uh, and I wish I had the elegance, eloquence rather, of Mr. Aikman, but I don't. Um, but folks, there's something I want, I want to say to you in closing. In, in, in my 68 years, life teaches us all that things aren't always as they may first appear. During the jury selection process, you promised, you took an oath, not to judge this case until you have heard all of the evidence. And that is what I'm asking you. That is what we are asking you to do. Keep an open mind. Listen carefully to what the witnesses really say, especially, especially when Mr. Rubin and myself have the opportunity to ask questions and cross-examine. Wait to hear all the evidence and wait to hear our final arguments. At the end of this trial, when you have considered all of the evidence and you have weighed it fairly and objectively as you are sworn to do, you will conclude there is a reasonable doubt in this case. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you Monday, and thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a recess. Uh, keep in mind the admonition, but primarily, as I emphasize strongly...